Hello and welcome, this is Solutions from Ukraine podcast, which is brought to you by Rubrica Media Outlet. My name is Vladislav Raponov, I'm an analyst at Internews Ukraine, one of the largest media NGO in the country, and also I am the co-host of this podcast. I am joined by my colleague Anastasia Rodenko, who is the founder and editor-in-chief of Rubrica, the independent media outlet, the first and one working in the solution journalism approach. Yes, our goal is to reveal some tangible solution stories from today's experience of Ukraine and give some insights which can be useful for you and maybe even inspiring. Yes, and in today's podcast we will explain how Ukrainians managed to proceed with their education at various levels and what solutions were designed to address the issues of war. And also we will touch the issues of lifelong education. Let's start. Vlad, what are your observations? What does the school year, which has already started in Ukraine, look like? Generally, I would say the situation uh, seems not easy, of course, and um, it remains so. Around 1,000 schools are damaged uh, by Russians. Uh, and despite the fact that more than half uh, a year passed, the situation is not utterly different from late February. The question raised by Midsummer was like offline teaching or online, and it is remained actual for um, for the whole of Ukraine. The situation was and remains really complicated. Many schools, we don't know the numbers, but I would say up to 30 percent, especially Western Ukraine, were used as shelters. I mean, a temporary home for people, namely internally displaced people, in the villages especially, where there is not so much time and resources to build new homes from scratch. Yes, and um, this is interesting that um, actually Russian propaganda was trying to invoke it internationally as well, uh, claiming that the Ukrainians are forcing everyone leaving schools, which was not true uh, first. And uh, of course, they didn't mention efforts to, to arrange homes for people but it is also worth mentioning that the same situation basically uh, exists with uh, Ukraine's uh, universities. It is uh, a bit harder to speak uh, about them because they have more autonomy and um, and they have also been more flexible um, uh, perhaps during uh, the COVID pandemic. So in that terms um, uh, like they are more experienced, I would say. And we have also asked uh, several middle and high school students around Ukraine how they perceive the challenges posed uh, by the war. And Michael from Odessa, for example, he told us that on the first day of the full-scale invasion, his class, um, uh, they even managed to have some uh, some classes, uh, he recalled the, the history lesson, while the city was already under attack. And um, he also told us that the classes uh, started again almost a month after February 24th. And it went the following way. If there was an air raid alert, the classes were put on pause. And if it lasts more than the normal duration of the class, uh, uh, he told that the teachers were saying, uh, like, um, like, don't worry, guys, we will try to catch up uh, the material later. But of course, everyone uh, had his or her issues like electricity, access to books, access to internet, uh, of course. But uh, he he said that, um, you know, uh, their goal number one was uh, to survive uh, and um, and move forward with their education. And they managed to do it, to do it well. By the way, Nastya, if you were to decide for you in your school time or for your children, uh, what would be your choice? Mm, it is hard to say, but let's put it that way. Of course, uh, security is a thing number one parents and children think of because we value the lives of our citizens, but we also value education that even during the war we have to move forward and cannot waste essential time. 
That's why Ukraine's local and national governments too were trying to set up shelters in schools in order for school students and teachers to go down there when the air alert system is on. For example, according to Ukraine's Minister for Education, uh, Serhii Scarlet, the Lviv region is one of the best in terms of readiness to have all pupils and teachers in shelters. Yeah, and it is it is no wonder because uh, it is uh, probably one of the most inhabited regions and uh, the one with a few damages due to Russian attacks. It is far away from the front line and from the occupied yes. territory, tempo- temporarily occupied territory. Yes, but it, it, it is also important to say that um, it is estimated that around 40% of all schools in Ukraine as of late summer, basically, they had shelter. Yes, and Ukraine's ombudsman, Sergei Horbachev, presented results of the poll, which indicates that before the school year has started, more than 60% of the school children choose the remote classes type. And only 15% choose the in-person school learning. And from the security point of view, uh, teaching online is safer because Russians launch missiles from time to time in the place where people gather. One can be at school when they see that offline learning has been resumed in their classrooms. Absolutely. And it is also worth mentioning that the police issued a statement regarding what a school student should have in his or, or her backpack Uh, It contains a bottle of clean water, some snacks, a note from uh, the parents indicating the child's full name, contact details of uh, close relatives, for example, um, the cell phone, of course, uh, a charger, a power bank, um, and also, in some cases, uh, police recommended uh, to include individual set of some some necessary medicines, uh, um, like a set of clothes, because because it is it is because uh, imagine one never knows when they can leave the shelter yes and uh, sometimes it can last like for uh, for, for actually five minutes and sometimes it can be uh, like a whole day or so and uh, the police also stated that uh, like uh, those those bigger things like food, uh, some water, um, even some blankets, uh, hygiene products. Yeah, uh, like schools uh, should basically provide uh, themselves, and um, I can recall that from from my personal experience uh, uh, because I have approached uh, my own school in, in uh, spring. It was in April probably, and I asked like if. Um, if uh, the school needed anything like some water some blankets or so and uh, the response was no it it meant that uh, they had uh, uh, like everything they need uh, like at that time for schools and for teachers uh, who who might use uh, it is the about shelter. school in mykolaiv of southern ukraine yeah yeah i would Also like to mention one thing, that we understand the full picture. Last year there were almost 5 million young Ukrainians going to school. Yes, and what are the numbers in terms of teachers left? Well, at least 5% uh, of all Ukrainian teachers are now out of Ukraine. It is the the official number. But despite that, uh, the school year has started in almost 13,000 schools. At the same time, Ukraine's Minister of Education already noted that since the beginning of the year, so it is even less than uh, three weeks, more than 400 schools switched off from the offline to online mode due to the to the shelling and uh, basically direct damages. So, Nastya, if we speak generally about the preparation for the school year, what cases have been the most remarkable for you as a journalist? Well, I think for school students, given the full-scale war, it is very important to be side by side with their teachers and classmates, even if it is online. I think this is also one of the reasons why many who left the country are still going to Ukrainian schools, even virtually. If we are talking about the specifics, obviously there are several major challenges. The one is to provide education in the regions that suffered from the occupation, including the Kiev region. 
And I would definitely mention the fact that the first kitchen factory in Ukraine is being built in Bucha, a place of horror when it was under occupation in spring. And imagine, less than half a year from that time, such a factory is under construction, where food for schools will be. Yeah, and uh, is it going to be covered from the state or local budget? No, no, no. The kitchen factory is being built with the patronage of Howard Buffett, an American businessman. It should be finished by September next year. The construction of the facility is part of the reform of school meals that began uh, before the Russian attack. So, and what is the solution in that case? Mm, so, the kitchen factory would be able to prepare like 10,000 portions. In this way, water and electricity costs are saved and food supply to children becomes safe and high quality. The main consumers of the products of the new kitchen factory will be Bucha's school and at least two nearby communities, like Borodyanka, a small city which was also badly damaged. Yeah, and it is remarkable if we think um, of uh, basically what happened um, in Bucha in spring and, um, and what the whole world has um, has witnessed uh, those russian uh, atrocities and um, and war crimes that have been discovered um, and i also assume that it will be also helpful for local citizens and ones who moved to, to kiev suburbs uh, potentially too and given the fact that there are 10 schools in bucha for just around uh, 30,000 population, it is a really basically remarkable effort, I would say. Yeah, this is a factor too. At the same time, I think it will be possible to provide food for any population in need, including the internally displaced people. But more importantly, the factory kitchen in Bucha is expected to become a pilot project. Eventually, the network of kitchen factories can be extended to other regions. Each of the enterprises will be able to supply food to 30-40 educational institutions, which is a lot for a city with a population around several hundred thousand people. Yeah, and this story shows how Ukrainians managed to make a fresh start even in places like Bucha with some international help. Let's switch to lifelong learning too. And I am going to refer to one of the unique stories to share. As you can see, education in Ukraine in general is definitely continuing. Universities, private education platforms are open. And I would like to stress education continues even for Ukrainian soldiers. Yes, education always continues for soldiers too in terms of adaption to new weapons and facilities. Our colleague got acquainted with the project which helps the military learn English in practice. It is entirely voluntary and depends on one person so far, a teacher from Kyiv, Olena Chekryzhova. A fascinating experiment is underway at one of the Ukrainian military base. Soldiers are learning English between training and shooting. European instructors who train our military do so in English. Instructions for weapons are also in English. NATO's requirement for future member countries is that officers should know English too, so it was very timely. The project team is still forming. Olena remains the only teacher who lives on a military base, but she is helped by more than 100 native English speakers who communicate with the military in a foreign language advise Olena and help develop materials. In addition, some Ukrainian teachers are preparing translations of military manuals, improving training materials and looking for an answer to the central question of how to expand the initiative to other units effectively. The plan now is to create a full-fledged platform, manuals and video courses for the Ukrainian military. But for this, the project will need financial support and probably even more human resources. Now it is entirely voluntary. And we will be glad to help such initiatives if you support us at Patreon. Such stories, uh, they once again prove that some Ukrainians like Elena, who potentially were able to leave the country and find a life 
of their own abroad are now staying in Ukraine and helping the country win even with such small but important steps. And this is our front too. And uh, you will find the link to the story in the description uh, on the platform uh, where you listen to us. Remarkable indeed. You can support us on Patreon. Half of the collected funds we will send to Ukraine's volunteer initiatives. Yes, you can support us at patreon.com slash rubrica to help us bring our victory closer. <laughs>